kindle and then the fire of thy life. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Now shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So tonight's going to be pretty good, okay? I've been, I've been toying with these ideas for a while, so we're going to toy with them together. And there will be certain points when I might ask, you know, what's going through your mind as we go, as we go through some I'm quizzing you. I'm just curious to know what's going through your mind, okay? Because these are really interesting ideas, uh, and there's a lot to it. So prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, you know, these are the standard works of the season of Lent. It's a season marked with a greater appreciation for penance and uh, the virtue by which we detest our sins, and also a season which invokes mercy a lot in the actions of both God and of, of ourselves, whereby evil is dispelled in body and in spirit. And while engaging in these works and cultivating penance and, and mercy are surefire ways of growing in holiness, there is yet a deeper process that we can identify as integral to the season of Lent. The process called justification. That is, the process of being made just, of living justice more fully and completely. St. Leo the Great, for example, in his sermons on Lent, mentions that growing in justice is one of the most powerful ways that we can develop our tools for spiritual work. So, quote 1A, and by, I'm just going to say quote numbers for you so you can follow along, okay? Quote 1A, St. Leo says, Demons are tortured by our being justified. That's amazing. You can torture demons if you want to. How do you do it? Be justified. He also says later on in a different sermon, you don't have this quote, but he says, Let the faithful now, during this season, Train themselves with the weapons of justice. Now, justice, I think, is perhaps one of the most misunderstood aspects of contemporary Christian life. There are some Christians, for example, uh, that say we need more mercy than we need justice. And in that worldview, you know, mercy is kind and justice is harsh. Mercy is what accompanies someone with love and acceptance. Justice is what oppresses others and judges them. There are other people who would say that what we need really is just social justice. And in fact, social justice outweighs everything else about Christian life, whether it's doctrine, whether it's morals, whether it's liturgy. In fact, being a Christian is to do social justice. I remember a terrible song from the university days, which was, go make a difference, go make a difference, go make a difference in the world. It kept going on and on like that. So. There are some who also emphasize the importance of justice, but have nonetheless fallen under the spell of such modern moral issues as voluntarism or deontology. These are ideas which tend to dissociate justice from the human heart and from our desire of happiness. Justice for these people is something purely external. It's a mechanical affair of exchange, of following due process. Now, all of these basically don't get the picture right. And that misunderstanding is tragic. Because if there was ever a time when we needed a really robust understanding of what justice actually is, it's kind of now. St. John Paul II remarks, this is quote 1b, Justice is the fundamental principle of the existence and the coexistence of men, as well as of human communities, societies, and peoples. Furthermore, justice is the principle of the existence of the Church as the people of God, and the principle of coexistence of the Church in the various social structures. In particular, the state, as well as of international organizations. 
In this wide and differentiated area, man and mankind are continually seeking justice. This is a perennial process, and it is a task of supreme importance. Now, since justice, since Lent is an intent, intensification of our Christian life, and since justice is such a core component of our Christian life, then it follows that during Lent we must especially intensify our quest for justice. But what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, to answer these questions, we're going to give two talks, okay? First one tonight looks at the biblical roots of how we Catholics understand justice. The second talk next week focuses on the greatest theologian in human history, St. Thomas Aquinas, and his synthesis of justice, which has been basically the most important thing since you know, sliced bread. Tonight, in discussing justice in the Bible, You'll see, uh, we'll, we'll first look at major concepts tied together with justice in the Old Testament, and then we'll look at how these concepts, concepts are played out in the New Testament, especially Matthew and Paul. And a note of warning, we are like scratching the surface of Lake Baikal, you know, the deepest lake in the world. We're like barely scratching the surface. These are profound issues that people much more learned and much more wise and holy than I have really devoted to a lot of energy to try to understand. So don't expect to come away. Don't expect to come away from this talk having absolute clarity. Okay? Because I don't have absolute clarity. I'm just in awe of how much there is about justice. In fact, I think you'll see that the vastness of what the Bible has to say about justice is in fact overwhelming. It is overwhelming. But perhaps we can begin by listening to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 58, when he describes the fasting that is truly acceptable to God. In this section of Isaiah, he's read to us in the liturgy on Thursday and Friday after Ash Wednesday. These are readings that the church thinks are so important for us to begin the season of Lent that it emphasizes it directly in the liturgy. So quote 1c. The Lord says to Isaiah, Is this the manner of fasting I would choose? A day to afflict oneself? To bow one's head like a reed and lie upon sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not rather the fast that I choose? Releasing those bound unjustly, tying the thongs of the yoke, untying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking off every yoke? Is it not sharing your bread with the hungry, bringing the afflicted and the homeless into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your, on your own flesh? Then your life shall break forth like the dawn, and your wound shall be quickly healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your beer guard. Now what do all those actions have in common? Why is it that these things are more valuable than fasting, which is by itself a noble act of religious asceticism? Because all of these are descriptions of justice. Walter, D Walter Dietrich, who's a, a scriptural scholar, makes this very bold claim, but one of for good reason, it can be said that justice is the secret core of the Old Testament. The core of the Old Testament. The Hebrew concept of justice has little to do with the Roman justitia distributiva. It's a Roman way of talking about justice. The idea of judging and apportioning without respect of person. So Roman justice, the image of Roman justice is what? Woman blindfolded, justice is blind, right? Not the Hebrew way of looking at it. He goes on. Rather, justice in the Old Testament has a clearly positive and prejudiced, prejudiced in a positive sense, prejudiced connotation in that it is about restoration, redistribution, and providing the right. 
God exercises justice, so also must humanity. It is the scale by which the relationship between humanity and God and the relationships between people are measured. It should and can be realized in all of the human community, in the state, economy, and courts, as well as in a village, family, and private life. So in the Old Testament, it's very clear that the source, the model, and the exemplar, and the absolute standard of justice is God himself. And therefore, the people that he calls into a covenant relationship with himself must likewise take on the qualities of justice. And this is not something that happens only externally in a state of mechanical dispassion. Justice is not cold in the Old Testament. Rather, it is something very heartfelt and something very personal. Justice is not blind. It looks very deeply at the network of relationships in which one lives. And why is this? Because God's relation to his people comes from his heart and is indeed very personal to him and indeed so visible to the point of being manifested in his own Son, Jesus Christ, as we will see in the New Testament. But before we get there, we have a bit of a challenge. There are multiple concepts in Hebrew in the Old Testament that can be used to describe what a just person is like, what they feel, and what they do. These concepts apply both to God and His justice, and to his people in their justice. And we often see that these kind of multi-variable concepts are linked together in many passages of the Bible. And so it's very hard to come up with a single definition of justice in the Old Testament. Justice seems to be something that affects many different dimensions of life. But, nevertheless, something that its aspects do have in common is that all revolve one way or another around how one relates to others. The idea of justice in the Old Testament involves around the idea of how you relate to others, how you relate to the world, and even how you relate to your own life. And especially, how you relate to God. Justice is always a relational concept. Okay? If, if there's just one, if there's one single human on earth, there would be no justice. Okay? Justice implies relation. We see, for example, in the creation of Adam and Eve, that God takes the time at the end of each day of creation to look at what he makes. And what does he say? No, oh, this is good. And the word for good that he says is tov, good, like mazel tov, good fortune. But when he makes Adam, he makes Adam like himself. And what does God say about that? He says, it is not hope for the man to be alone. And so he fashions Eve. Human nature in creation is itself relational. We are always born into a community, a family, and we only live and thrive within a community. This point is even made by Aristotle, you know, the pagan Greek. He says that human is what? A zoon politicon, a political animal. He says that humans are more gregarious than bees. And he even says that a human who lives by himself, apart from others, is either a god or a beast. That's Aristotle. So it's important to note that the state in which Adam and Eve were created, when they were created in the garden, in right relationship with one another and with God, this right relationship was called original justice, for example. And you think, well, why is that? Where's the justice there? Justice is a relational concept. Okay, so that's kind of the introduction, but. Let's take a look at four, we're going to look at four key ideas that are tied together with justice in the Old Testament. Okay, and you can follow along in the handout. And 
you can stop at any time, okay? You can raise a hand if you have a question or if something's confusing. Go, go bonkers with questions. So the first concept that we're going to look at is that called Tzedakah. Okay, this is 2A in the handout. Tzedakah. In English, Tzedakah is often translated as righteous or just or fair or good. Okay, that's a broad, broad smattering of words. This word, tzedakah, has the sense, has kind of the idea behind it of giving to others or being disposed to give to others. Tzedakah has the sense of fairness also in what one gives. In the Bible, tzedakah is inseparable from the practice of giving to the poor, especially which is an absolutely unique trait of observant Jews in the ancient world. Now, in the ancient world, giving gifts to someone, this is a whole interesting realm of uh, sociology and anthropology, but giving gifts to someone in the ancient world was not a purely disinterested practice. You don't just give a gift to someone for no reason. You give it, there's the idea that if you give a gift to someone, is precisely for the purpose of them now having to give you something back in return. And this back and forth exchange creates a bond. It creates a strong relationship, either a friendship, a patronage, or a kind of civic back scratching. Okay, there, there are certain ancient writers that say like the, the, the foundation of a city is gift giving. You know, giving to one another. Mutual gift giving was, in a certain sense, the backbone of ancient civilization. And so, giving to the poor, therefore, giving to someone that can't give you something back, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense in the ancient world. But, what God reveals to the people of Israel is that by giving to the poor, they're actually giving something to him. And if the poor can't pay back, then guess who can? God. Creation is itself already a gift from God to us. And by freely giving the gifts of creation to others, we form a bond with God. To be righteous, to be just, to be Sadiq, the adjective of Tzedakah, to be Sadiq involves this giving, which is intelligible from a cosmic point of view. Psalm 11, this is a quote uh, to a one, a one, says, The Lord is Sadiq. And what does he love? He loves Tzedakah. Psalm 12, Psalm 112, for example, is a portrait of what a just person looks like. It describes all of their attributes, all of their features, and all of their actions. In verse 9, it's book A2, it says, it says this about the just person. Lavishly he gives to the poor. His tzedakah shall endure forever. Now consider what several of these authors have to say about tzedakah. Rabbi Donin, who is uh, writing in the 70s, writes this. This is A3. Israel will not be redeemed except through the practice of tzedakah. Every person is required to give tzedakah according to his means. Even a poor man, who is himself a recipient of tzedakah, is required to give tzedakah to others, even if he can only get a little. It is forbidden to turn a poor person away empty-handed, even if he is given but a small amount. If one truly has nothing to give, the poor person's feelings should at least be assuaged with some comforting words. To inspire and bring others to give Seneca is a great virtue and merits an even greater reward than that of the donor. The great rabbi Moses Maimonides, whom St. Thomas Aquinas frequently used as an authoritative, authoritative theological source, writes in his guide for the perplexed, a four. The term tzedakah is described from tzedek, which means righteousness. 
It denotes the act of giving everyone his due, and of showing kindness to every being according as it deserves. He concludes, every virtue is thus set up. That's a big idea. Every single virtue that you know about falls under setting somehow. The contemporary Catholic scripture scholar Gary Anderson concludes a vast study by saying this. This is A5. The point is clear. What one does for the poor registers directly with God. It is as though the poor person was some sort of ancient automatic teller machine through which one could make a deposit directly to one's heavenly account. Just as an altar was a conduit of sacrifice to the heavenly realm, so the hand of the impoverished soul, so was the hand of the impoverished soul seeking charity. So, Zedeka is a way of describing justice that doesn't easily fit into modern categories. Okay? Because when we talk about giving to the poor, what, we, what word do we use? What words do we use? Like charity, what else do we use? Okay. What? To donate, to give, yeah. What else do we use? Philanthropy. Philanthropy, yeah. You're a lover of people, that's right, yeah. But we often don't use the word, this is justice. Even though we might understand, oh, this is justice. Do. That's not the first thing that comes to mind. Whereas in the, in the Bible, it is. This is just. This is what you are supposed to do. Seneca is a way of describing justice that doesn't easily fit into modern categories because it's deeply embedded in a Jewish scriptural view of the world. The person who is Seneca gives. But why do they give? Because of the reality of God, and because of the promises that He makes, and because of the law and the covenant that He gives us. So we have this, for example, I have here a a six, a seven. If you ever read the book of Tobit, it goes bonkers on Seneca. You know, if you, it's bonkers. Okay, so the quote six here. Uh, there's these sections where people just give advice to one another. It's kind of nifty. But this one quote here. Perform Seneca all the days of your life and do not tread the path of wickedness. Okay, so being Seneca is the opposite of being wicked. Okay? Give alms from your possessions. Do not turn your face away from any of the poor so that God's face will be not, not turned away from you. Give in proportion to what you own. If you have great wealth, give alms out of your abundance. If you have but little, do not be afraid to give alms even of that little. You will be storing up a goodly treasure for yourself against the day of adversity. For almsgiving delivers from death and keeps one from entering into darkness. Almsgiving is a worthy offering in the sight of the Most High for all who practice it. And the next quote there from Tobit again. Almsgiving with Zedeka is better than wealth with wickedness. It is better to give alms than to store up gold. For almsgiving saves from death and purges all sin. Those who give alms will enjoy a full life. But those who commit sin and do evil are their own worst enemies. Isn't that interesting just how these ideas of Zedeka is associated with giving alms to the poor. And what's the opposite of being set up in, in, in this worldview? It's being evil. An evil person doesn't practice Zedeka. Okay? That's Zedeka. There's a lot more I can say about that. But what's going through your mind right now? Like, what's, what's interesting? What's hanging? What's confusing? Uh, and what's, what's going through your minds right now about Zedeka? If anything. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting with the concept of to give to someone who can't give back to you. So like the ultimate to God gives all that stuff to us. Yeah. And we cannot give it back. So we're the poor people here at the we should keep passing it along. That's right. Yeah, and, and it's the the idea of giving to the poor and why? Well because 
because God's going to give that to you. That's, I mean, that's, a, that's a big idea. When you read a lot of, for example, there, there are these ancient Roman philosophers who they'll, they'll advise like kings or like politicians to make donations to the poor, but why do they do that? So they get popularity. Right? It's a very different idea than like, oh, I'm giving the poor, so God owes me. That's a big idea. And this actually ties over, but this is directed to teeth in what Christ also says, right? Store to yourselves treasure in heaven. Okay? And how do you, how's one do that? By giving the poor. That's the ancient Jewish idea. Treasure in heaven comes to the poor. Yeah? Yes, that's right. The widow who gives just a little bit out of her own, or out of her necessity, in a certain sense, gives more than the people are giving out of their like, like they're skipping, they're, they're kind of skimming off the top of their, their wealth. Yeah, and that, that that's like, like Boku Zedeka. That's a lot of Zedeka. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah. This comes into other places also. So this is a great question. Yes. Um, so, with, uh, so part of um, so what Tobit says, for example, in quote six, um, you know, he, he says, "Give in proportion to what you want." Okay. So this is also kind of where, where Christ does ramp it up a little bit later on, where he says to certain people, he says, you know, "Give your possession to the Lord and call me." Give everything away. Okay. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how this gets fleshed and kind of fleshed out with some more concepts. So that's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Um, but Seneca, okay, Seneca, giving. Okay. The just person does what? They give. But Seneca is often closely linked with another concept, our second aspect of justice in the Bible. This concept is called mishpat. I love saying this word. It's funny. It's a funny word. Mishpat. Mishpat in the Bible knits together three big threads. Okay? One thread is law. Another thread is moral goodness. And the third thread is judging or judgment. For example, the, the modern Hebrew word for a lawyer is a mishpatah. A lawyer is someone who mishpats. Okay? Mishpat in the Bible is often translated in English as judgment or as justice. Now, we do have to realize that when Jesus says, do not judge, he's not banning every and all form of judgment, but only ones that we are not qualified to. There are certain judgments that belong to God and to His omniscience alone. We have to make judgments. Is this good or is this bad? That's a judgment. Is this the right thing to do or is this the wrong thing to do? That's a judgment. Have I sinned or have I done what was tzaddik? That's a judgment. Should I speak or should I be silent? Should I act or should I refrain? Should I work or should I rest? Should I give or should I refrain from giving? All of those are judgments. But the person who is mishpat is the person who always judges what is true. Their judgment is always right. They judge not only just simply in accord with reality, but with God. This is why God is mishpat. And this is why there are a number of passages in the Bible that go, they start praising God for his judgments. They're praising God for mishpat. And one of the important outcomes of mishpat is that one's life and the world around you become set in order. They become set and they're allowed to grow to their proper goodness. So quote uh, B1 here. 
Uh, this is uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Hirsch, who says, Mishpat stems from the root word, Shafat. The basic meaning of the root is to put something in its proper place. The primary meaning of Shafat is thus to impose order. And the next quote uh, from, oh, can I give you that one? Oh, I have another quote here from Rabbi uh, Ettlinger who says, Mishpat is weighing one's actions to see whether or not it's wholesome. In the Bible, Mishpat is very closely associated with Seneca. They, they occur together in phrases so many times. Why? Because the person who knows how to make a correct judgment can make a correct judgment about how to give to others. And they can make judgments in, form, in, in harmony with the judgments of God, as expressed in the Law and in the Prophets. So, I'm going to just read these quotes here. B, B2, I'm going so forth. B2, from Psalm 89. Seneca and Mishpat are the foundation of your throne, speaking to God. So imagine God sitting on a throne. What are the kind of two pillars of his throne? Seneca, Mishpat. Those are big deals. Okay, quote B3. Psalm 103 says, The Lord does Seneca, and he brings Mishpat to all the oppressed. And here is Mishpat, like in the sense of like being a judge. The poor are coming to have their cries heard, and the judge is able to make a correct judgment. How should I help these people? Psalm 106 says, The Lord loves Mishpat. He loves it. It does not abandon the faithful. If you want an overwhelming source of praise for God's judgments, for his mishpat, then I would recommend on your free time looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. 23 times in a single chapter, God's mishpat is praised. There's also a number of texts in the Bible that describe evil people as doing what? They make bad judgments, or they turn away from the judgments of God. One of the most staggering texts is Proverbs 21. Now we know, before we read Proverbs 21, we know that sacrifice was one of the most important religious aspects of Jewish life. It's commanded by God himself in the law given to Moses. This is one of the greatest ways to praise God was to offer sacrifice. But amazingly, it's called B6, Proverbs 21 says this, To do what is tzedakah and mishpat is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. That's a big deal. To do what is tzedakah and mishpat is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So let's go with your mind right now. What's, what, what's clicking with the mishpat? Does that make sense? Is that confusing? What's reminding you of? What's making you think of? Yeah. Well, one of the things I noticed is that the examples you seem to give are always like judging ourselves and not judging others. The, the, the examples, yeah, uh, like judging ourselves, that is true. There is, a, there is a good sense of judging others in the right way. So, for example, is this, a, is this a person that I should help or not? That's a judgment, right? I think just like you said in the beginning, how it was hard for people in the ancient world to want to give to the poor, the book kind of reminded me of like, um, how um, people like, would offer sacrifices and it was such a huge part of their lives that for someone to come out and say that uh, that that mishpat, more important than that, would be like something that would be easy to accept. Yeah, it does not compute. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, that to, when when you study Judaism compared to other ancient Mediterranean religions, like it's wild. It's wildly different. Very different ideas from that, and a lot of it is their moral sense. Yeah, how how on earth could Seneca and Mishpat be more acceptable to a god than offering a sacrifice to them. It's wild. Yeah. So, um, when we, we've been 
that next mission, the reading from today, talked about you know, uh, how Saul uh, didn't seek the king of Samuel for the sacrifice, and that is seek God, and um, that is a reflection of how obedience is more important than the sacrifice to God. But then it reflects on how obedience, the, the obedience to God is the sacrifice. It's the greatest sacrifice in the universe the world. How would that be? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. It, well, in a certain sense, with obedience, you have to, well, what should I obey? You have to make an appropriate judgment about that, right? Um, in fact, it's that judgment that allows you to make the sacrifice. You know, and so it's, it's, it's kind of like, the way I think of Mishpat is kind of like the, it's kind of like the, the, the filter through which you look at things. In a certain sense, it's kind of you don't even notice it. It's something like wearing glasses sometimes. It's how you look, look at the world, how you make judgments, even very kind of uh, judgments that you're not aware of. In a certain sense, but the person who is mishpat, their judgment is it's clear. Okay, it's in the form of reality. They make the judgments that they need to, and their judgment connects exactly with reality. With how has God set up the world? Because you can see that, right? Because people can become very deluded. You can start seeing the world in a very different light. You know? And so this is why, for example, you know, when you're talking about Seneca, Tobit says, you know, you, you gotta practice Seneca. And why? Because otherwise you're in the darkness. There's this interesting idea there. But yeah, I, I, that's a that's a great point though. I, I think the about obedience. I'll, I'll do a little more research on that. So, thank you. So, Zedekah and Mishpat describe a just person, but they're also closely with another quality of justice. It keeps going. This quality is called Khanan. Khan is translated in a, in a crazy number of ways in English. Mercy, graciousness, pity, Showing favor, compassion, generosity, favor, and grace. Okay, take your pick. In fact, Khan in the Old Testament is often seen as a major source for the theology of grace as developed by St. Paul in the New Testament. And while its etymology is very debated, Khan is exemplified in turning to someone in their need. Okay? Khan is when there's someone in need, and you kind of go, oh. Yeah, it's like you look at them. Or, uh, it's also uh, kind of exemplified in stooping down to someone who needs help. Kind of lowering yourself to help someone. So Khan is, takes a very personal interest in the life of someone else. Okay? This is, this is a big idea. Khan takes a very personal interest in someone else's life, especially when that life is marked by suffering or by misfortune. So you can already think about this. You know, what, 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 do, what do wicked people do? They don't care about other people. They don't care. You know, if someone suffers, they're like, yeah, too bad for them. A just person is not like that. And this is, above all, common kind of the quality of God. So when Aaron gives his priestly blessing to the people, he says, Numbers, uh, uh, this is quote C1, his prayer over the people of Israel is, The Lord that in his face shine upon you and be common kind to you. May God have be common kind to you. And the Bible likes to contrast the good person from the bad person the just person from the unjust person. And one of the pivotal qualities that distinguishes the two is the presence or the absence of common. Quote C2. Psalm 37 says, The wicked man borrows and does not repay, but the tzaddik is common and gives. Proverbs 14 says, those who oppress the poor revile their maker, 
But those who are common to the needy honor him. The wicked are overthrown by, the, by their wickedness, but the sadiq find a refuge in their integrity. We see passages that even weave together all three of the concepts that we've covered so far. Okay, this is where it starts getting meta. Okay? Psalm 112, for, for example, see I quote C4. It is good for the man Khan in lending, who conducts his affairs with Mishpat, for he shall never be shaken. The Sadiq shall be remembered forever. All three of those ideas come together. Okay? The just person. They're sadiq. They practice mishpat. And they're khanam. Okay? So, what, what are the contemporary words? Or how would you describe khanam to someone else? Well, what's a contemporary word for like what we're talking about here? How would you, how would you phrase it to someone else? Anticipating the needs of others. Yeah, I like that. One of the things that kind of brought to mind was you heard right in the old time, remember how there was a homeless gentleman that uh, didn't have any gloves. It was snowing at that time. And Hudson gets out and gives him his gloves. And that's that's going to do so much more for that gentleman in that moment. Right. Doing you know, that right, that's right. Yeah, being, being prepared to give. Being prepared, being prepared to meet the needs of others. Exactly. Yeah. What's another example? Uh, attunement was something I thought of. Attunement. I like that. What, what, what do you mean by that? So, like when you're attuned to another person, that means you're able to kind of, in line with that, anticipate their needs and know who the person is, and also, um, but you're also willing to give to them at the same time. Like if you can be attuned to someone and anticipate their needs, but then not follow. That's awesome, attuned. Yeah, to be attuned with another person. That's great. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah. I think this is what someone would say entering in. Entering in? What do you mean by that? Charity. 
Hesed is a foundational core of Old Testament and Jewish moral reflection. It is what gives birth to the actions that, in Catholic language, we would call the works of mercy, whether corporal or spiritual. So, for example, the Jewish writer Mark Greenspan, and this is uh, quote D1, he writes this, One can't say enough about the importance of Hesed or Gimelot Hasidim, acts, the acts of Hesed, the acts of loving kindness. This is the generic term for a whole variety of actions, including hospitality, visiting the sick, dowering the bride, providing interest-free loans, redeeming captives, burying the dead, and comforting mourners. Okay, that's Jewish thought, right? And that, for us Catholics, that sounds like those are the works of mercy, right? And the Talmud, okay, a very authoritative collection of reflections in rabbinic Judaism, says that Hesed is actually, in a certain sense, more important than Tzedakah. Okay? Where it is wild. So this is a, a quote D2 from the Talmud. It says, Our rabbis taught in three respects, Gimelot Hasidim, the works of Hesed, are superior to Tzedakah. Tzedakah can be done only with one's money, but Gimelot Hasidim can be done with one's person and one's money. Tzedakah can be only given to the poor, well, Gimel and Hasidim can be done for the rich and the poor. Tzedakah can be given to the living only. Well, Gimel and Hasidim can be done to both the living and to the dead. Yeah. Rabbi Donin, for example, I really love the Rabbi Donin, he explains how Hesed is not an optional part of Jewish life, but is in fact required to it's required for what's called the concept of a mitzvah, okay? A mitzvah in, in Jewish thought, we're going on a, a D3. A mitzvah is like a religious obligation. This is something that's not like, it's not an optional part of your life as a practicing Jewish person. This is obligatory. Okay? So think of this like, you know, like going to Mass on Sunday, you know, it's an obligation for Catholics. Like a mitzvah is like an obligation for Jewish people. Okay? So, Rabbi Gunnan says, this is called D3, the concept of kindness, hesed, includes all forms of kindness shown by a person whenever he exerts himself on behalf of another. A person is bidden to praise the virtues of another, just as he would like himself to be praised. And to be as protective about his friend's assets as he is about his own. It is a religious duty, a mitzvah, to extend the hospitality of one's home for food and lodging as the need arises. It is a religious duty, a mitzvah, to visit a person who is taken ill. It is a mitzvah to visit a person in mourning and to comfort him in his sorrow. It is also a great mitzvah to provide funds to enable orphan girls or very poor girls to marry. It is a mitzvah to personally provide for the return of a lost object to his rightful owner. If one sees a neighbor whose life is in danger and he is in a position to help or can engage the help of someone else, he is obligated to go to every trouble and expense to do so. It's pretty intense, right? That's hesed. It's not an optional part. The scriptures also weave together hesed with all of those other components of a good, just person. Okay, so starting on D4. Psalm 33 says about God, for example, He is tzedakah and mishpat. God loves tzedakah and mishpat. The earth is full of the hesed. Lord. Psalm 23, 24, to bring an accounting, you know, the psalm that the Lord is my shepherd, says this, Surely goodness and hesed shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. 
And this is how the Bible in Exodus 34 describes the moment when God appears to Moses at Mount Sinai to establish his covenant with his people. It says, The Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name Lord. So the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and kind, slow to anger and abounding in hesed and fidelity, continuing his hesed for a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet not declaring the guilty guiltless, but bringing punishment. Psalm 103, D7, weaves together all four aspects that we've been covering to describe God. Okay? D7. The Lord does tzedakah and brings mishpat to all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and to the Israelites his deeds. Merciful and kind is the Lord, slow to anger, abounding. And in a powerful text from the prophet Jeremiah, God says this about himself. It's in D8. Let not the wise boast of his wisdom, nor the strong boast of his strength, nor the rich man boast of his riches. But rather, let those who boast, boast of this, that in their prudence they know me. Know that I, the Lord, exercise Hesed, Mishpat and Sedekah on earth, for in these I take delight, thus says the Lord. So weaving all four of those together, what does a just person look like in the Old Testament? They kind of look like God, okay? But what do they do? The just person gives generously. They judge correctly. They feel Passionately, and they act kindly. Okay. Any thoughts on Hesed? Let's go through. So that's our that's our Old Testament section. Okay. Whoa. Go through the Hesed and Blitz. Old Testament. What are your thoughts? You know, if you've never studied justice in the Old Testament, what's striking you? How is it different, or how is it similar? Like, what's striking you?
Uh, and part of the reason why we can go through very quickly in the New Testament is that there's only one word <laughs> that they use for justice, uh, which is, it saves us a lot of time, okay? So we can take a look at uh, justice in the New Testament. And one of the main ideas that I want to impress upon you, however, is that there's a very clear continuity with the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't just chuck out everything in the Old Testament. It builds on top of it. Okay? The New Testament doesn't chuck out all those aspects of justice. Rather, it actually perfects it and brings it to a bit higher level. Okay? Um, so, a little challenge that we do face is the challenge of language. So when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, they use the word dikaiosune. Okay, so this is on your, this is, if you're following the handout 3a, you see that word dikaiosune. Okay? That's the word that they translated for Seneca. Okay? But, part of the issue is that dikaiosune already had a very well established use in the Greek language and also in Greek culture and Greek philosophy, okay? So when, the, when they're writing the New Testament, they both have to describe the Old Testament ideas, but also because they're using Greek, they're also kind of importing Greek ideas, okay? So the New Testament kind of fuses together both Jewish and Greek thought in a very amazing way. And in a way, I like to think kind of uh, symbolizes the mission of the church, church to both Jew and Gentile. Okay? So what's the background for this word, dikaiosune? Okay, so A1 here. Um, in the ancient philosophical discussions, dikaiosune tended to be used as the headline or summary of ethics. So that the term itself become, became as broad and formal as our right as opposed to wrong. That was specified by various rules of society or philosophical ideas. So basically, if in Greek you want to say, oh, that's the right thing to do, you'd use this word dikaiosune. If you want to say, oh, that's the good thing to do, oh, dikaiosune. It's like, oh, is that the, the is that the lawful, righteous thing to do? Oh, that's dikaiosune. Like any good thing that you can describe about human action, you can fall, you can put somehow under dikaiosune. That's a broad idea, okay? You see this even in, in ancient philosophy. So Plato and Aristotle talk about the Iverson. They talk about it a lot. For example, they use it to describe both the very particular virtue of justice, which in Greek thought was part of the four cardinal virtues, but they also use it just in general to describe a good person. Dick Iverson, that's what a good person is. Good person has the chaos in it, or in the adjective form, they are dikaios. Okay? So, for example, Plato in the Republic talks about the dikaios, the, 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 the just, good person. And how is he describe them? As someone who has harmonized all the aspects of their life so that they know how to act well. So, quote A2 here. Okay? What is, what is a, a dikaios person? One who is dikaios, one who is just, does not allow any part of himself to do the work of another part. He regulates well what is really his own and rules himself. He puts himself in order. He is his own friend. And he harmonizes the three parts of himself for Plato does the reason, the spirit, and the appetite. Like three uh, limiting notes on a musical scale, high, low, and middle. He binds together those parts and any others that there may be in between. And from having been many things, he becomes entirely one, moderate and harmonious. And only then does he act. So think of like, uh, in a certain sense, a, Plato describes the just person as kind of like a, a, a harp. It's been tuned. Okay? All the strings are tightened to exactly how they should be and how you tune something in relation to the other things. So once everything is completely tuned and harmonized, that's when you can be dikaios. That's when you can have dikaios. Aristotle also, in the Nicomachean Ethics, 
described dikaiosune as a state of character that make, makes people do what is dikaios. This is kind of redundant, but the, the just person is the person who does just things. And the person who does just things, they're the just person. Here's the, the good person is able to do good things. And apart from the particular virtue of justice, the good person exemplifies dikaiosune. So quote A3. Aristotle says, the best man is not he who exercises his virtue towards himself, but he who exercises it towards another. The justice, the dikaiosune, in this sense, then, is not part of virtue, but virtue entire, virtue itself. Nor is the contrary justice a part of vice, but vice entire. So basically saying, <clears throat> if you are dikaiosune, you are virtuous. You have all the virtues. So that's kind of a, that's a big idea for ourselves. So Jewish thought of justice and the Greek thought of justice are both at work in the New Testament. This is to deeply respect the Old Testament, but also to bring in the development of the Greek thought. So for example, we'll look at uh, the Gospel of Matthew, okay? Uh, so we're going to start looking at uh, uh, 3b, Dikaiosune in Matthew. This will be really quick, okay? When we look in the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Jesus is very insistent that his followers exemplify justice. They exemplify Dikaiosune which is one of the prime translations for Tzedek, as, as well as some of the other words. In fact, it's one of the dominant themes in the Sermon on the Mount. Two out of the eight Beatitudes are concerned with Dikaiosune. Okay, so book B1. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for Dikaiosune, for they will be satisfied. A lot of times, uh, knowing the background changes how we have to interpret that. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for dikaiosune, that they will be satisfied. And then next, blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of dikaiosune, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Christ continues, Amen, I, mean, I, I tell you, unless your dikaiosune surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Huh. Beware. Beware not to perform dikaiosune in order that people may see it. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your heavenly Father. Seek first the kingdom of God and his dikaiosune. And all these other things will be given besides. So part of what we see in the Gospel of Matthew is that following Christ is not a rejection of the Old Testament justice and its attributes, but it's really its fulfillment. It brings it to even a higher level. Being a Christian involves profound justice. As Christ himself says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the I'm not going to abolish, but to fulfill. Okay? We'll go really quickly into Romans and then we'll be done. Okay? In fact, understanding the Old Testament teachings on justice helps us understand the criteria by which Jesus will judge us, by which he will exercise his speech about us. So, uh, by the way, so, I have my Bible here. If you read, if you read uh, Matthew 25, let me pull my Bible out of here. Listen, listen to what Christ says here about the last judgment. And listen to it through the lens of what we've been talking about. Okay? Listen to this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, 
He will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the decoy, the righteous, will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you? Uh. The king will say, Amen. Whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Remember the idea of giving him the poor gets your head of God? Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you are cursed in the, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food, and so on and so forth. And the verse ends, and this is book B7, the verse ends, And these, the wicked, will go off to eternal punishment. But the decaio, the decaio, the righteous, to eternal life. Okay. So, Paul. How, how's Paul getting Paul here? Okay. This is the end. Um, St. Paul argues that the efforts to achieve decaio's name in the Old Testament were imperfect. Because the fullness of God's decaio's name had not yet been revealed to us. And how is the decaio's name of God revealed? In Jesus. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says that Jesus is the decaio's name of God. If you want to understand decaio's name, you look at Christ. He is decaio's name. And if you have access to Christ, then you have access to true Tikaiosun. And this access, St. Paul says, is not through the law, not through the prophets, but through faith. The law and the prophets prepared us, they pointed the way, but through faith in Christ that we have true Tikaiosun. So it quotes T1 here. Romans it says the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for Jew first and then Greek. For in it is revealed the decaiosune of God, the faith of the faith. As it is written, the righteous one, the decaios, will live by faith. And in chapter 3, St. Paul makes this ground in argument. But now the decaios name of God has been manifested apart from the law, though testified to by the law and the prophets. The decaios name of God through faith in Jesus Christ, asterisk, for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. They are now justified Verb here is to make someone just, dikaios. They are now justified freely by his grace through the redemption of Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as an expiation through faith by his blood to prove his dikaios because of the forgiveness of sins previously committed through the forbearance of God, to prove his dikaios in the present time that he might be dikaios and justify to make Dikaios the one who has faith in Jesus. So St. Paul in this very complicated sense there. Okay? A lot of parts But I include, I don't want to go too late. Um, we'll just finish. Justice in the Bible. Okay? Justice in the Bible is far from a simple reality, right? Although it does, although it wasn't focused on, it focuses how someone relates to others. 
that focuses on how someone relates to God. It even does focus on how you relate to yourself. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel are called to imitate the justice of God by their generosity, their judgment, their compassion, and their kindness. However, this was all a preparation and a foreshadowing for the full manifestation of God's justice, his righteousness, in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the righteous one who makes us righteous. He makes us righteous with his own righteousness infused into us. His righteousness changes us to the depth of our being and enables us to perform works of righteousness. In Christ, and in Christ alone, we can have full and true justice. That's the big idea. So, any questions or comments about that? Or, or what's, I'd be curious to know, like, what's, what's your takeaway from this? Like, what's the point that's sticking with you? What's something you want to chew on more? What, what reverberated with you? you know, I, so, the Aristotle stuff was talking about. That you are not kind of virtuous person, you are a virtuous person, or you're not a virtuous person. Kind of. There's there's a there is an intermediate state which is called continence. Mm-hmm. So continence it's not a medical term. Continence here is a moral term. Mm-hmm. The continent person is one who can force themselves to do the right thing. Okay? You have to kind of like white knuckle. But you have to force yourself to do the right thing because part of you kind of doesn't want to do it. Right? Whereas a virtuous person, they do the right thing and they want to do the right thing. In fact, their greatest pleasure is doing the right thing. So virtue is, is a very, it's not only an action, but also presents kind of a feeling base to it. So, yeah. so, that, so that's what, yeah. So I'm trying to connect that then to Paul, St. Paul was saying that a person becomes justified not through the law but through faith in Jesus, that they become, I don't know, we're not, we're not perfect in faith, so maybe we're in that continent state, but once we reach, we're in heaven, we reach that perfect just state. I'm trying to connect those ideas. So mm-hmm. today, well, I think, so, there can be, there's already a sense that by the faith that you have in Christ, you already have a share in his, his justice. Mm-hmm. And the way to talk about this, actually, is, is through, I think, the language of participation. So, St. Peter uses this, but I think it applies to St. Paul as well. So, the idea of participation in the ancient world, participation is when something begins to take on the qualities of something. So for example, the example, the classic example is like if you have fire, you know, what are the qualities of fire? It's, it's vibrant, it moves, it's hot, it glows, it's kind of orangish. And then like take a lump of iron, for example. What are the qualities of iron? It's cold, it's hard, it's inflexible, it's, you know, it just kind of sits there. It's inert. But what happens when you start to move iron closer into fire? The iron starts to take on the qualities of fire. Right? It starts to glow, it starts to get hot, it becomes malleable, right? So in a certain sense, faith is a grace. The classic definition of grace is grace is participation in the life of Christ. Grace is when you start taking on kind of the life and the qualities of Christ. Okay? Now, is that complete? Not yet. That's going to be complete in what's called the state of glory, which is when we have our resurrected, resurrected bodies. But it doesn't mean that the participation until that point is, is true. Okay. There is a sense of progress to it. So, yeah. Okay, so. Does it kind of, kind of make sense? Yeah. Well, sure, yeah, we'll show sure. yeah. what, what, what else? What, what else is sticking with people or, or chewing or? 
What's your take? Thank you all.